Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. At the end of 1944, the German army on the Eastern Front was reeling after suffering uh, defeats at Stalingrad and Kursk. Hitler was keen to hold on to territory the Germans occupied, but all the while the Wehrmacht was forced to give up ground to the Red Army. In this episode, we're going to be looking at the fighting throughout 1944 for Army Group South in the Ukraine and Romania. I'm joined by Prit Buttar. Prit is the author of a number of books recounting the fighting in Russia during both world wars. His latest is The Reckoning, The Defeat of Army Group South, 1944. Now, before we get to that, this podcast is made possible by listeners like yourself who enjoy the show and help me find the time to put it together when they become patrons by committing to a dollar or two each month via Patreon or even pushing the boat out and committing to the Rockefeller level of support like listeners Liam Reese. Thank you, Liam, for your support. You can find out more at patreon.com slash ww2podcast. Now, if patron is not your thing for whatever reason and you would like to join the gang, go to ww2podcast.com forward slash support and you'll find information on how to uh, support the podcast via PayPal. In doing so, if you check the box to be added to the mailing list, I'll send you links to the extras as and when I have them. So that's ww2podcast.com forward slash support. Prit, thanks for um, joining us. Um, I, I think your overarching thesis in uh, The Reckoning is that the Red Army throughout 1944 is not just successful due to its size, but its ability to learn, which is perhaps something the Germans arguably stopped doing at some level. So if we're going to unpick that, I guess we need to look at the start of 1944. Russia's a huge theatre, um, but we're going to be concentrating on Army, Army Group South. Um, I wonder... Coming out of 1943, how does the year look for the uh, for the Germans? 43 was dominated, of course, by Kursk and the aftermath, and in particular the retreat uh, to the Dnieper Valley. There was a general feeling in the German army that when they reached the Dnieper, they would find well-fortified positions, they would be able to take up proper quarters, the endless retreat would halt, and they would be able to bring the Red Army to a to a standstill. The problem was that, that in, in many cases, the Red Army got to the river at about the same time as the Germans, and uh, it became very much a race to the river with this laborious retreat across um, the central parts of Ukraine, the, the panzer divisions fighting a constant series of spoiling actions, trying to beat back the Soviet spearheads that were trying to outflank the retreating Germans. And of course, when they reached the river, they found that there were very, very few fortifications uh, in existence and they would have to do the lion's share of the work. The Red Army was aware that the, the Dnieper was at least in theory a very defensible line because the West Bank is, is generally higher than the East Bank and it overlooks the East Bank, which would give the defenders a great advantage. But, you know, you had to get to the river first. You had to have sufficient troops to man defences all along it. And of course, you needed defences to be constructed. And the Germans really didn't succeed in any of those three. The result was that autumn and early winter, uh, so the end of 43 into 44, sees the Red Army forcing a number of bridgeheads across the river, and then expanding these despite every German attempt uh, to pinch off the bridgeheads or to destroy them. Uh, there's a huge airborne operation mounted by the, the Red Army at Bukharin, uh, and people who are familiar with uh, the mess ups that occurred in Market Garnum and Garden and the Arnhem operation, well, you want to read about Bukharin, it went disastrously wrong. Some of the, the company commanders only received details of where they were going to be dropped um, when they were actually flying to the drop zone. Um, it was the, the operation was mounted in such haste. The parachutists had descended with uh, an uh, a panzer reconnaissance battalion on the ground firing up at them, um, and the whole thing just went to pieces. Nevertheless, um, the Red Army did succeed, basically enforcing pretty much the entire Dnieper line uh, by the end of the year. 
So as you go into 1944, the Germans are feeling rather crushed because their, their hopes of holding this river line are gone. The Red Army is over in strength. Kiev has fallen. A successful counterattack was launched west of Kiev, which had some uh, successes, but nothing compared to the successes of Manstein's counterattacks of a year before. Again, it was launched with fresh divisions brought in from the West. But this time around, the Red Army was much, much better um, at dealing with these. And combination of weather and better Soviet defences brought those counterattacks to a standstill. Does Manstein have any ideas on how he's going to uh, run his campaign in '44? He does, and there are, there are serious flaws with this. Manstein says in his memoirs that he still believed at that time that it was possible to fight the Red Army to a standstill, um, that some sort of draw could be achieved, opening the way for, who knows, a negotiated peace. To my mind, this reflects the political naivety of, of a lot of senior German officers. They would have been aware of the Casablanca de- Declaration and the intention of the Allied powers to fight until Nazi Germany was completely defeated. He may or may not have been aware of the statements of people like Morgenthau in America who had said that the problem is Hitler and the Nazis. If they're gone, then options become available. But certainly other Germans were, and hence the growing resistance movement culminating in the July plot. Manstein's um, operational uh, plan, if you like, was essentially a repeat of what he had done the previous year, where he had pulled German forces out of the eastern end of his line in the Caucasus and had then used them to restore um, the German front along uh, the Donetsk uh, Valley. And again, he now wanted to pull troops out of the Great Bend in the Dnieper River um, near Nikopol. He wanted to abandon Crimea and use those troops to move west uh, and then launch a counteroffensive to restore firm contact with Army Group Centre. But this would have involved abandoning the Dnieper Bend. It would have involved abandoning Crimea. um, And Hitler was having none of it. So regardless of whether... Manstein's strategic objective was even achievable. Um, His operational plan for achieving stability uh, founded on Hitler's refusal to countenance such a major retreat. There's no overall commander-in-chief for the Germans in Russia, either that falls to Hitler. So does that cause complications? Because you've not even got a man on the spot running the show, have you? Well, it's always caused complications. And this started with the dismissal of uh, Brauchitsch uh, at the end of the failed attempts to take Moscow in 1941, and when Hitler took command uh, of matters in the East. And by the time you get to 1944, this has become so intrusive that even moving individual divisions uh, requires Uh, clearance from uh, Hitler and from the high command. And yes, technically it's uh, Okaha that is giving the approval, but uh, the chief of staff is not going to give approval without Hitler's say-so. You then get the ludicrous situation that when when two German corps were surrounded uh, in the Cherkasy pocket and uh, Manstein attempted to mount a relief operation, he moved 24th Panzer Division from the Nikopol bridgehead uh, north to, uh, to help in the operation on the grounds that it was one of the few Panzer Divisions available to him that was at near full strength. It launched an attack towards the encircled troops on the afternoon that it arrived. Um, And before midnight, Hitler had discovered that it had been moved without his permission, and he ordered its return to Nikopol. The the journey from Nikopol to the Cherkasy pocket and back uh, cost 24th Panzer over two thirds of its wheeled vehicles, uh, broken down or lost in the snow. It didn't achieve anything at Cherkasy. By the time it returned to Nikopol, a new Soviet offensive had broken there, which it would have been in position to deal with had it not been withdrawn. But it spent the entire campaign labouring through the snow in both directions. You've got this funny thing where you've got really a political... uh a politician essentially in charge of the army, you know, in, 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 well, in general. Uh, but how does that work with the relationship with Van? Well, I was going with these commanders, but I was thinking of Manstein particularly in the, in this instance, because, you know, in a purely professional way, one would like to think military commanders act professionally, but when you've got a political com- a commander in charge, people fall in 
and out of favour. And I think at one point Manstein's in favour. Is he still in favour and getting what he wants by 44? No, I think by the end of 43, uh, his star is very much um, you know, declining in, in Hitler's eyes. He has repeatedly asked for permission to withdraw. Hitler has granted that permission very belatedly or grudgingly. And then that's resulted in a further request for withdrawal. So from Hitler's perspective, his attitude is all you ever do is retreat and then you want to retreat some more. And Manstein's left saying, yeah, if you'd let me retreat when I wanted to, I could have stopped it. But that that is lost on um, Hitler. And Hitler's entourage, uh, by the end of 43, is openly mocking uh, Manstein. Uh, Goebbels and the like are all saying that uh, all that Army Group South does is retreat. Uh, Manstein is interested in large-scale operations for self-glorification rather than anything else. The, and Hitler has issued his directive by now, very much emphasising that Germany can only win the war. It's a statement of the obvious, really. Germany can only win the war by knocking out at least one of its opponents and then concentrating on the rest. And his decision is this will have to be in the West. So he wants to hold back sufficient forces in France to defeat the expected Western invasion, and then release those forces to intervene in the East. But that means that in the meantime, the Eastern Front is just going to have to hold on with what it has. That's really not enough for it to hold on, especially in the face of an increasingly effective uh, Red Army. And, and people like Manstein must have known this, that, you know, they weren't, you know, Manstein's constantly saying he sh- he wanted more troops. He must have known, even though he was not officially getting detailed information about what was going on in Army Group North or whatever, he would have had enough informal contacts to know there were no quiet sectors left in the gap. You know? What surprises me is how frank he seems to have been with Hitler and how long he seems to have got away with it. Well... Yeah, we only have his memoirs to... to <laughs> um, and, you know, as, Always a problem, yeah. Well, as I mentioned in my book, you know, a cynical view of memoirs or uh, autobiography is the story of a hero by one who knows him best. And, you know, you certainly get that reading Manstein's memoirs and particularly Hermann Balk's memoirs. They are just so self-glorifying. And I, I can't remember a single occasion where Manstein admits he made a, a mistake or, or that he got something wrong. Even as Kursk is unwinding, he still doesn't really acknowledge that, yeah, maybe this wasn't such a good idea, you know. And Balk in particular is just notorious for this. It's always someone else's fault, never his fault. So, you know, the whole, all of those fiery exchanges that, uh, with Hitler that fill Manstein's memoirs, they're all uh, they're all describing conversations where there were no other witnesses so we don't really know for sure what was said i don't doubt he spoke his mind but whether he was quite as forthright as he claims who knows if we if we look at the uh, the uh, russians um you know they'd had some big victories in 43 at the same time those victories victories had come uh, at a cost um how do they look at the start of 44 are they confident absolutely they they are brimful with confidence they have won everywhere they have broken the siege of leningrad they've mounted counteroffensives either side of the kursk bulge the uh, to the north of kursk uh, the katusov offensive was another of these awful grinding attacks which racked up huge casualties for relatively modest gains. But the rolling offensive across central Ukraine and then across the Dnieper, this is really, um, I I cover this in my book, Retribution, and I think one of the the aspects of it that is poorly understood is that much neglected field of logistics. As the, the Germans fell back, they laid waste to that entire region. They didn't leave an intact bridge or railway anywhere. And yet the Red Army reaches the Dnieper and with barely a pause for breath, throws itself across the river and keeps the supply of munitions, replacement tanks, food, everything that you need to keep the army moving. And at every stage when the Red Army just pauses for breath, it's like a fortnight, it's 10 days and they're at it again. And the Germans, you know, even though they're falling back towards their supply centres, they can't cope with that sheer pace of operations. And as you see the year unfold, the the panzer divisions, which have been desperately trying to, to stop the Soviet penetrations, 
by the end of 1943, they're pretty much burnt out. Um, they have, they've been in constant action. They have no strength left. Um, there's a, a rather harrowing report from the, medical, the chief medical officer with 8th Panzer describing the state of the Panzer Grenadiers and the number who are suffering from frost injury and wet injury, so what we would call trench foot and the like, and the men are exhausted, they are disease-ridden, they are lice-ridden, their uniforms are in a mess, and their combat effectiveness is pretty low. And it's terrifying reading. And then you think, and these are the panzer divisions, which are always better off than the ordinary infantry, which form three quarters of the army. And the infantry are in a terrible state uh, by the end of 43. This idea of this sort of Russian horde sort of steamrolling along. And I made a note that the Russians lost, it, I think it's 22,000 tanks in 43 to the Germans, 9,000. And everyone says, oh, well, the Russians had masters of this stuff. I wondered if casualties and they, that kind of those kind of losses, if by 44 the Russians were slightly more mindful of them and they weren't quite throwing men in as they had been absolutely they were and again this is something that you got to, i think the the point's what that's worth making again that the general english language narrative of the eastern front was written by german generals writing their memoirs in the 50s when uh, the the soviets were once more the enemy and it it served a lot of purposes to portray the red army as this mindless horde and it's relatively recently that people like david glantz have re rebalanced that discussion there's no doubt the red army suffered huge casualties but at a, a dinner for his army and uh, corps commanders at the end of 1943, uh, Tolbukhin, who commanded 4th Ukrainian Front, um, addressed uh, his off senior officers and he said to them, we've now advanced across central Ukraine. You have seen the devastation that the Nazis carried out uh, on our land. You have seen the, the smashed factories, the destroyed dams, the, the burnt towns. Remember, it takes four years to build a factory it takes 10 years to build a dam and a power station but remember it takes 20 years to grow a soviet soldier and never forget that that the sons of the soviet union who are serving in your ranks are almost irreplaceable he, okay he probably went a lot further than most um senior soviet commanders did but it's interesting um you know more recently where accounts by ordinary Soviet-era soldiers have come out. Some still describe their you know, middle-ranking uh, commanders as fairly brutal and callous and not really caring about losses. But a lot of them say that you know, the officers did all they could to try to minimise losses, and they, they, did, they did everything they could. A quick word about the tank losses. Again, the numbers can be quite misleading here. The Germans tended to describe their own tank losses purely in terms of tanks lost in action, uh, where a tank was, was burned or blown up or whatever. So a tank that was recovered uh, because it had broken down uh, would appear in the war diaries of the Panzer divisions or whatever, not as a, as a destroyed item, but as a tank that would be available in either a short or a long time, depending on how much damage had been done. And then during the retreats, most of these damaged tanks would end up being abandoned because parts weren't available, trains weren't available to move them. Those abandoned tanks never appear on the German losses. So when you see these accounts, it's always worth just remembering, you know, certainly when you get, for example, Panther tank battalions, where Panther units regularly lost as many Panther tanks to breakdown as they did to enemy action. Now, in a highly fluid battlefield where the Germans are, are having to go backwards quite quickly, how many of those Panthers were recovered and actually returned to service? It's, it's a very, very hard thing to, to calculate. One way of looking at that is if you look at German tank production, where we have fairly decent figures and we know how many tanks were being produced, and then you look at how many divisions are still being kept in the field, then you start seeing a discrepancy. How could you be producing this many tanks and yet the number of divisions is at roughly the same. And all those divisions are reporting they only have two thirds the number of tanks. You know, where are all these tanks disappearing to? If we're, if we're looking at the Russians again, uh, uh, you know, it's um, Zukov and Konyev uh, who are running the show. Are they allowed to fight the battle that they want to fight? Yeah, very much so. And I think that this is the lesson that Stalin learns, that Hitler never learns. Stalin attempts to micromanage 
for example, um, the Soviet counteroffensives after the Battle of Moscow, uh, and he gets it terribly wrong. And, you know, the huge casualties for very, very little gain. Likewise, he, his trusted sidekick, Timoshenko, launches the Kharkov offensive in early 42, and that ends disastrously. And thereafter, Stalin is tending to take a more hands-off policy. To a large extent, this is due to his growing confidence in people like Zhukov. The unspoken uh, hero of the Red Army uh, was Vasilevsky, who was the, the chief of the general staff for much of this time. Vasilevsky is slightly unusual in his memoirs in that he doesn't actually sing his own praises. He goes out of his way to be generous uh, in his recollections about other people. And many um, of his contemporaries criticised him and said he was a bit soft and he wouldn't stand up to Stalin. I think a more astute observation of that would be he knew how to handle Stalin and he knew when it wasn't worth having an argument with him and when actually you could quietly make your point and then the following day Stalin would phone you up and say I've had a great idea and and you'd say oh yeah great, fantastic let's do that you know so you know Vasilevsky had done so much to show uh, Stalin that actually you know what the field commanders know what they're doing and they are getting better so by the time you get to, um, you know, 1944, the, the Red Army is, is beginning to show the level of, you know, lower level initiative that is vital for mechanised warfare, because the battlefield changes so fast, you've got to be able to think on your feet. And a good example of how, how the situation was changing and, and changing very actively is in the planning for the great Soviet offensive of 44 against Army Group Center, uh, Bagration, where they tore Army Group Center to pieces. At one point in the planning for that, Rokossovsky wanted to launch a pincer attack on one of the cities, I think it was Bobruisk, one of the cities that had to be captured at the opening phase. Uh, Stalin wanted to launch a single thrust to take the city and Rokossovsky said, no, I want to launch a pincer. It'll cost us fewer casualties and I need those men if I'm going to mount a deep operation and carry on the offensive. So Stalin said, hmm, think about it and left the room, at which point uh, Molotov and one of the other cronies turned on Rokossovsky and said, look, the boss says a single thrust. It's got to be a single thrust. And Stalin came back in and stood by the map and said, so are we agreed then on this? And Rokossovsky doggedly said, no, we're going to have, I still think we need a pincer attack. And Stalin thought about it for a while and then just smiled and said, OK, on your head be it. So, you know, <laughs> the implication was there, but he was listening to the people who knew what they were talking about. And, and, you, and this is the great development through 43 and 44. The generals have shown that they can do it. And Stalin is learning to trust them. If you look at those uh, at the start of '44, there's a, a number of serious developments the Germans seem to find themselves in, uh, but they they somehow just seem to wriggle wriggle out. So at the start of the year, is it, 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 do we see so the Russians sort of testing out how they're doing it? But the Germans just have that tactical edge would that be a fair way of putting it to wriggle away i think that is fair and i think the red army is still learning its craft and one of the fascinating things is even during 1941 stalin was instigating reviews of battles and of, of operations uh, in, an, in an attempt to find out why are we so rubbish at this what how do we get better at this and these reports surfaced at various times and influenced the way subsequent operations were launched. They influenced the, the force structure of uh, particularly the mechanised forces. They changed the balance of the forces in order to learn from the mistakes. One of the features that you see throughout the war is repair teams in armoured formations go from being virtually non-existent at the beginning of the war to a growing part of the establishment of tank armies, tank brigades, etc. by the end of the war. The awareness that you just lose a lot of tanks through breakdown. And if you've just got somebody who can replace a, a drive sprocket or a gearbox, you can keep your tank strength going. So all the way through the war, the, the Red Army is systematically reviewing its operations and getting better. The Germans, by contrast, have no reviews whatever 
of their setbacks. And even after the escape from the Cherkasy pocket, where the, some of the staff officers are tasked with producing a report, it isn't shared with anybody. It just disappears. It, uh, there's no promulgation of best practice. So one of the things that the Red Army consciously worked on was envelopment and how to carry out a successful envelopment and finish the job. Because they felt, you know, Star Stalingrad, yeah, cracking envelopment, we did it. And then we had to digest what we had bitten off. And that just took forever. And it tied down inordinate forces for a very, very long time. During 43, there wasn't much of an opportunity for an encirclement, largely because Manstein managed to pull back his forces to the Dnieper in a fairly you know, concrete front. It was only after um, the Dnieper had been passed that opportunities arose for encirclements. So the first two encirclements of the year at Karovograd and at Cherkasy, the, the Red Army experimented with, do you, when you use tanks to achieve an encirclement, do you then turn the tanks outward to drive the Germans back further, or do you turn them inward to crush the pocket? So they're actively experimenting with this. They're experimenting with the second echelon, which at Chakassi was made up of a cavalry corps. And they look at using the cavalry corps to turn inwards. And when the lesson they learn from that is that actually it isn't mobile enough. And cavalry are great at exploiting open space, but once you hit resistance, they don't have the heavy weapons. So you've got to be able to move artillery quickly in order to crush a pocket. And finally, at Bagration, they get it absolutely right. And every encirclement that they form there is overwhelmed before the pocket can harden, before the Germans can mount a rescue operation or whatever. So it's a great example of, the, of just this, this continuing evolution of operational doctrine, changing the force balance that you're using, how, how the echelons are, are made up so that you can maximize not only the initial penetration, you can overwhelm any encirclement. And this is, if you like, full fruition of the pre-war Red Army doctrine of deep battle, of, of multi-echelon warfare and, and progressing the battlefield right through the depths of the enemy's position. I wonder how much you think Hitler helped them with that, because I might have got my timeline wrong here, but somewhere around, is it March 44, he starts talking about fortress defences and this idea of, well, what we need to do is stand still and let the Russians come on and, and you know beat themselves in our fortresses so you get that is it first panzer army 200,000 men surrounded at which point it kind of does that not help the russians with their development well to a very large extent it does and, and again memoirs are unreliable here and of course a lot of the german generals blamed the fortress policy for a lot of the disasters it should be remembered, though, that a lot of the fortress policy was forced upon Hitler because he had largely no, no other option. There was a limit to the amount of space he could trade for time. If he just carried on retreating before the Red Army, the Soviets were going to be on German soil before the Western Allies landed and he got a chance to deliver a blow uh, in the West. Also, um, one of the, the consequences of the fortress policy, which actually worked in favour of the Germans, was it resulted in supplies being concentrated much further forward. And this meant that encircled units retained a degree of mobility uh, a little bit longer. So, for example, during uh, the encirclement of First Panzer Army and its ultimate breakout from the Kamenets Podolsky encirclement, they received some supplies by air, but actually, you know, Huber's uh, wandering pocket was very much self-propelled on the supplies that it had when it was surrounded. And it managed to fight its way back over a very considerable amount of space. That wouldn't have been possible necessarily without a fortress policy. So ultimately, the fortress policy was always doomed because in the end, you're trying to defend too much territory with too few men. But it wasn't an entirely negative thing. It did achieve some useful purposes. I, I couldn't believe in these pockets when they're flying in fuel, how much fuel they're flying. It's tremendous amounts. It really must have ham hamstrung the uh, uh, the area. If they Luftwaffe flying in gallons, thousands and thousands of gallons of fuel. Yeah, and uh, and then you get the you know the uh, the nonsense of having to. Uh, tip barrels of fuel out of the back of low-flying aircraft because you don't have enough parachutes left to drop because you've just done so many airdrops um, and supplies being dropped on the Russians who gratefully use them to refuel their vehicles, you know. Manstein's replaced by uh, Model 
it's summertime around March, isn't it? So does he bring anything new to the theatre? I mean, mo- is it model? Is model the fire? Is, is model the fireman? Very much the fireman. Yeah. So yeah, model arrives uh, on the Eastern Front uh, at the end of the Kamenets Podolsky encirclement. Uh, so that, I think this is into April now. The the relief column that linked up with Huber's troops as they were pulling back to the west uh, was made up of uh, two SS Panzer divisions, ninth and tenth uh, SS Panzer divisions which had been held in France in readiness for um, uh, the Allied invasion, but were sent east on the proviso that they would be released very quickly and returned to the West. And they mounted a successful operation. They linked up with Huber's pocket and they managed to get uh, First Panzer Army out. Modell then commanded the army group during the, the Soviet follow-up operations, which saw uh, the Red Army reach the Dniester and mount its first penetration to Romania, the first Battle of Yassin, which largely ends as a German victory. Modell, had he lived to write his memoirs, would undoubtedly have claimed this as another great defensive triumph. But, you know, by now the Red Army's supply lines are over 300 kilometres long, and it's really difficult to keep that momentum going. And it had to stop somewhere. The Germans, by contrast, have been falling back on their supply lines. You have, you know, burned out divisions like Gross Deutschland and 24th Panzer being almost entirely rearmed after their personnel arrive in Romania. Um, they managed to get all of their specialists, all their, their tank crews, etc., out alive. And by now, um, uh, Speer's modernization or, or rationalization of the German war effort is bearing fruit. So actually, we've got quite a lot of new tanks and guns arriving at the front line. And these divisions were much to the surprise of the Red Army. They hadn't been wiped out and suddenly they were back in action. What I found fascinating was it hadn't occurred to me that as you pull back, the theatre of responsibility no longer fail. It is no longer the Eastern Front, it sort of borders on the Western Front. So the Germans then have problems with suppliers both uh, theatres vie for supplies very much so and particularly when they got into Romania uh, where uh, OKV controlled uh, movements across Yugoslavia and Bulgaria etc um, whereas uh, OKH was controlling the front line it just becomes chaotic and not only that you then have Romanians and Bulgarians just arbitrarily holding trains up you know, the, the war effort is really falling apart by now. The German officer corps, you know, they, they, they probably acted as a force multiplier uh, from the start of the war because you know, the, 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 the German officer they were very uh, aggressive, efficient. They have sort of, sort of limited freedom of command to do what they want. Um, I, I mean, are they as effective by 44? To some extent, they are. I think in some cases, they certainly are. I think it depends on the theatre. I think it depends on the local chain of command. It also depends on their opponents to a very large extent. You know, there's been this this sort of belief that German use of what was termed Auftrags tactic and this, you know, devolved decision making that made the Panzer Division so effective, that this was largely paralysed by Hitler's interference. And there's no doubt that it did paralyse it to a considerable degree. But, you know, Auftrag's tactic is alive and well all the way through till the end of the war. The panzer divisions are still operating with considerable tactical freedom. Um, and what, what has been lost is, if you like, the operational freedom, the ability of a core commander to pull a division out of line in one area and reinforce success elsewhere. That's pretty much gone. But the ability of, of individual commanders on the ground, battalion commanders, regimental commanders, to show local flexibility and flair, that remains very high. The problem that the Germans have, though, throughout 44, is one of officer casualties. They are largely running out of these experienced, skilled officers who know how to delegate. They know how to take liberties with the orders they've been given. Um, These these men are now dying out. Uh, Many have been wounded, many are dead. Others have been promoted in order to fill gaps elsewhere. Likewise, at a lower level, the the very experienced and very, very skilled NCOs, probably in 1941, maybe into 42, the German NCOs were probably in a different class from their equivalents in any other army in the world and routinely would command formations 
at least two ranks higher uh, than you know would be seen in, for, for example, in the British or American armies. You know, you'd have a you'd have a sergeant running a company, uh, a rifle company, and doing it doing it extremely well. By the time you're getting into forty four and forty five, those men are running running out, um, and certainly by the end of nineteen forty four. Uh, Giller, the commander of uh, SS Viking, uh, told uh, Guderian at one point that uh, I can't get the men of the same calibre that I used to have. What uh, what I used to be able to accomplish, accomplish with four men now needs a dozen. Even that that tactical edge, that skilled edge, is is very much going. By contrast, the Red Army is getting better and better. And although the Red Army continues to suffer terrible, terrible casualties throughout the war, it's always worth remembering it's the least experienced guys who get killed. You have this solid core of experienced fighters who are going through battle from from one, one battle to the next. And yes, they're suffering losses too, but they're just getting better and better. And they're able to... Uh, to pass on their expertise to the younger recruits. Uh, so that provided you survive your first battle, you've probably got a pretty good chance of surviving the next one because you're learning as you go. And, you know, it's far easier to learn those lessons when you're winning and when you're going forward, when you're constantly retreating and you're leaving comrades behind and you're leaving wounded behind and men are disappearing from the front line. The, the, the sort of human dimension comes in and the sort of subjective sense of defeat starts to influence your ability uh, to learn, to innovate, to keep on going like that. For an army that's essentially in retreat, is a, a lack of objectives a problem for the Germans uh, as much as it is a potentially a strength for the Russians? Because Surely without any objectives, you're only reacting. Well, indeed. And, you know, any, any staff officer will tell you that, you know, at every level, um, your objectives uh, serve to uh, deliver the objective of the level above you. So you have a strategic aim to, for example, to capture the Caucasus oil fields. You then mount operational aims to get you there. And then the operational aims in turn dictate the tactical deployment of your forces in order to achieve uh, you know, that objective. The trouble is when your only strategic objective is to cling on to every inch of ground, it's, it becomes much harder to devise operational objectives that are subordinate to that and that can deliver on that. Yeah, you're right. So, you know, there there is no sense of, you know, if we can take this town or if we can capture a crossings over that river or whatever, that's going to make our lives a lot easier. It is just a sense of we're just going to have to grind on and on and on. And there is no end in sight to that. What is remarkable is that despite this succession of defeats, and the evidence of their own eyes, the rank and file of the Wehrmacht remain completely loyal to Hitler. And even when news reaches the front line of the failed July plot, the general reaction is one of outrage and horror. And yet, yet the evidence of their own eyes surely tells them that the war is lost. You know, I think it's sometimes very, very hard for us to to bridge the gap from growing up in a culture where we have free access to so much information and so many different opinions, and then putting yourself in the position of someone in a much more controlled news environment. It's an interesting point that you make is that you didn't, do you feel that, tell me if I'm misrepresenting it, that the Stauffenberg plot was doomed because the rank and file completely were not on message with with it, whereas the message we always get is, well, there's sort of an officer corps who, if it had happened, it would have stepped in. But you're of the opinion that was not the case. Well, it's it's a very good point, good question, and this has been debated endlessly. And I had a lovely, not so much argument, but but a proper debate about this with uh, my very good friend Peter Caddick Adams on one of our uh, battlefield trips last year, um, where over a, a couple of drinks we talked this through and. You know, Peter was saying that he, from, he remembers meeting many German veteran officers who regarded Stauffenberg and his fellow plotters as, well, yeah, they were do, perhaps doing the right thing, but, you know, they broke their oath and they had given an oath of loyalty. 
my view has always been that if you like the doctor in me the you know having been a gp for much of my life and spent a lot of time getting into the psychology of my patients a part of me sees a great deal of transference in that how much of this is just a deeply buried sense of guilt that there were other men who were prepared to go against their oath and these officers weren't and i can't help but feel that this is this is a very heavily nuanced field there's not not a simple answer no individual was driven by a single motive in all of this you know there were there were all sorts of nuances to this but you know i i make the point a couple of times in my book it seems to me that certainly at the higher level when you get to army and army group command it must have been crystal clear that the war was lost that there was no prospect of any wonder weapons coming to the rescue even if the western allies could be driven back into the sea were the 20 odd divisions from france really going to make much difference on the eastern front against uh, against you know the the losses that have been suffered paul hauser the ss general who uh, commanded the ss panzer corps at uh, kharkov in early 43 and deliberately disobeyed hitler's order to hold kharkov and abandon the city and then launched a successful counterattack to retake it um, he wrote after the war that there are occasions when you just have to disobey because you have an obligation to your men and sometimes if the order you have been given is just frankly wrong then you've got to step up and do it now the price of that might be that you know you're going to have to answer for that but that's what you've got to do and it seems to me that Stauffenberg and Herbner and and Beck and the other plotters were prepared to do that and a lot of the other generals would sit on the sidelines and wait and see whether or not they succeeded before they jumped. What would have happened had the, the, the plot succeeded in killing Hitler? Well, you know, Manstein and Balk and others wrote in their memoirs, well, there would have been chaos and general collapse. And, you know, I'm sitting there reading their memoirs thinking, what, a little bit like happened in April, May 1945 anyway, only it would have happened a year earlier with a lot fewer dead, you know. So I don't think there was ever any prospect of the plot overthrowing Hitler, replacing it with a new regime and the army then remaining loyal to the new government. It would have brought about a catastrophic end of, to the war, but probably no worse than happened in 1945. Talking of memoirs, sort of in this sector, we have the southern sector, we're, we're fighting along sort of the Romanian border and things. Now, they, these non-German allies usually get a bad reputation. I wondered how much it's deserved and how much is it uh, some of these memoirs blaming them for their own problems, you know, German problems. Well, well, indeed. If if you if you just go back a couple of years and you go to the collapse of the Don Front, which largely created the crisis at Stalingrad, first of all, you have the Romanians collapsing, um, then you have the Italians being routed, then the Hungarians. And the Germans, you know, by then they're just saying, you know, these these armies are worthless. These troops are, are hopeless. What they forget is that as part of the collapse of the Don Front, further north, uh, it struck the German Second Army and the German infantry divisions proved just as brittle as the Italians and the Hungarians and the Romanians. And whilst, you know, there are numerous occasions where German infantry do hold on in the face of Soviet armoured attacks, Certainly by mid to you know, the second half of 44, uh, unless there are panzer forces close by, the German infantry is every bit as brittle uh, as their allies. And certain, after the end of the, Iron, uh, of the Soviet Union and the, the fall of the Warsaw Pact, the Romanians have largely revisited the history of the fighting against the Soviet Union, and they have tried to portray the, the Romanian army as putting up rather better resistance. It's worth noting that it served all sides to portray the Romanians as very lukewarm allies of the Germans during the war in the years that followed, because the Germans wanted to blame the Romanians and say they were rubbish. The Romanians by then were part of the Warsaw Pact and they were allies of the Soviets. So they wanted to say, you know what, our heart really wasn't in it. We didn't want to fight for these nasty <laughs> Germans, you know. So it's taken time for that historical legacy to pass. 
I think the clue lies when you look at the second battle of Yassi and the, the, the Yassi uh, offensive of the end of the summer of 44, which very rapidly overwhelms the German and Romanian forces and sweeps across Romania, knocking Romania and then Bulgaria out of the war in short order. In the early days when the, the Red Army is fighting its way through the Romanian troops, you've got a daily advance of six miles. Now, if the Romanians were genuinely throwing down their weapons and welcoming the Red Army, I kind of think they'd have pushed on a wee bit faster than that, you know. So, again, it's a matter of just looking at the evidence that is, if you like, not open to interpretation. Just look at the, the hard data and not people's opinions. And I suspect, undoubtedly, there would have been Romanians who were only too pleased to lay down their weapons, uh, whether it was to, because they were pro-communist or whether they were just heartily sick of the Germans or whatever. I can understand them or being war-weary, whatever. I understand that there were probably a lot of Romanians who were very happy to see the end of the war. But also, I don't doubt that there were plenty of others who put up very, very strong resistance right to the bitter end. Mm, and I wonder how many of them were not possibly getting the supplies they anticipated in uh, armour, tanks, everything else as it gets diverted. Indeed. And, and, you know, during the retreat from the Don in 1942-43, there are numerous cases of German soldiers forcing uh, Italian and Hungarian troops retreating alongside them to hand over their vehicles to the Germans so that they can continue their retreat. Um, you know, the, I mean, this is well-documented stuff. You know, the Germans treated their allies pretty badly. And in the end, I think they kind of got the loyalty they deserved. Mm. So where is the army group uh, south at the close of 44, the period we're looking at? This is a little bit like, you know, this is sort of 70, 75 minutes into a football match and you're 4-0 down. The game isn't over technically, but actually it pretty much is, you know. Um, Sixth Army has lost most of its heavy equipment um, in eastern Romania and a lot of its personnel. Many of its troops do succeed in escaping uh, to the line of the Carpathians, but they've lost an awful lot of equipment that's not going to be replaceable this time around. And again, they've lost experienced men. Most importantly, the Romanian oil fields are now gone. So uh, Germany has lost its last source of, of non-synthetic oil. Um, and, that's, and that's a little bit coming from Hungary, but that's not going to last very long. So, yeah, Army Group South is still in existence, but it's made up of these, these Volksgrenadier divisions, which... They kind of have the right uh, numbers of men, but a lot of these men are not fit for frontline service. They're not properly equipped. Um, they're quite deficient in uniform. And certainly by now, I can't help but feel that if the July plot had taken place in December 44 rather than summer 44, I think by then a lot more German soldiers would have taken a rather different attitude to it. You know, particularly if you think that a lot of these Volks Grenadier divisions are made up of older men who have now been mobilised and sent to the front line. And unlike the, the men they're replacing, these 20-somethings who have been fighting all the war on the Eastern Front, now you have these Volks Grenadiers who have seen firsthand the devastation of Germany's cities from uh, British and American bombers. They've seen the chaos that is descending across Germany. And I think they had a rather different attitude and weren't quite so committed, you know, to, to carrying on because they had faith in the Fuhrer. Now, that will be a fascinating topic in itself, picking up, you know, their uh, attitudes in late 44, these men have been pushed to the front. Yeah, it would be. It would be very difficult to research accurately, though, now, because, you know, everything was so coloured after the war. You know, it's a little bit like if you were to read some accounts, every second French person was a member of the resistance and, and every second German secretly hated Hitler. And you're kind of left wondering, so who voted for the National Socialists in the first place then? You know, historiography has been so distorted by the needs of the Cold War and the need to rehabilitate Germany in order to fit it into NATO, etc. You know, it, history, history has been so distorted that 
it does mean that it's a it's fertile ground for people like me to keep on redigging it for a very very long time. Well, I would say even if you've got the letters at the time, you've got to bear into mind that who they're writing to are they censored? Uh, you know, do, do they want to commit any of their thoughts to paper, even if it's a diary? Yes, and, uh, and how many of the more controversial letters were just torn up as soon as they arrived in order not to have a paper record? You know, so so yeah, and and also, but by the as you get into forty four onwards the previously reliable records start falling apart. You no no longer have intact war diaries for a lot of the divisions um, because the records were lost. Uh, so, you know, even just being able to trace uh, equipment levels becomes much, much harder. Yeah, interesting. Well, Prit, thank you for joining us. Folks, if you want to know more about the fighting on the Eastern Front, uh, the book to read is The Reckoning, The Defeat of Army Group South, 1944, by Prit Butta. As ever, I will put a link on the website. For patrons, uh, I will have a bit more for you of Prit and I chatting, so look out for that. And if you're not a patron, you can join the gang at patreon.com slash ww2podcast. Well, that's all from me for now. I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening. <laughs>